where you've been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the promise of the journey that God knew you were going to be. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. And while you're getting there, Stacy is right. We have missed you. We have missed you. Being away, I got to preach at a bunch of different places, a conference, and, and, and everywhere I went, I just said, I, I really miss my foe. I really miss my, my family here. And even my daughters looked at me and said, we're ready to get back to our, our church family. You guys are irreplaceable. What God is doing in you is completely different. And it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of your lives. Now, if you are at Proverbs chapter 4, I want you to say, all right. All right. Proverbs chapter 4. Now, if you're not there, you can still say all right because it's going to show up on the screen. And that's okay. All right. All right. All right. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. This is where we're going to jump off of. And I'm going to talk about issues this morning because everything I'm looking around in the world around me has to do with issues. And issues take on a couple different meanings. For, for most of us, when we talk about issues, we're talking personally. We all got our own personal issues. You wake up every day with issues that you have. And, and it causes us to, you know, it gets in the way of our relationships. It gets in the way of our relationship with Christ. It gets in the way of our destiny. It gets in the way of all these different things. But recently in our country, events have, have occurred that have caused us to bring to light a bunch of different issues. And these issues are bigger than us. It's bigger than me waking up in the morning and feeling good about myself. These issues have to do with a systemic breakdown in our society in which things that have laid under the surface and we act like isn't there have now come up to the surface, bubbled up, and now we have to face them. But the problem is we as human beings are not used to really having meaningful, honest, balanced dialogue with one another. We're used to taking sides. And I want to talk today not about the issues themselves. I'm kind of tired of, of talking about the issues themselves. It, it's sort of like we're trying to, to take a sick tree and we're trying to cure a sick tree by just plucking off the, the sick fruit and throwing it away and leaving the tree alone. You can't fix a tree that way. You can't heal it. You got to deal with the root of the issue. And I want to talk a little bit about the root of the issue. And I know Janet spoke last week and she spoke to some of the heart of the issue. And, and I want to I want to I want to kind of jump off that and, and, and give a little bit different slant to it on something that God has spoken to me over the past four weeks about how we as a people can bring about cultural reformation and see these things, these issues, actually be healed. But Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. This word issues. In you, God says, I want you to guard your heart. To guard your heart with all diligence. In other words, you need to guard it. And in the Hebrew, two words for guard are actually used. It's sort of like guard, guard your heart with all diligence. It's sort of like he's putting an emphasis on the fact of how it's so important for you to guard your heart with everything in you, with all diligence. And, and diligence means with, with, all, with everything in you. And to do it, not just on the side, not just kind of go, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just watch what I, what I eat or watch what I, what I watch on television, my music a little bit. But he says, I, I want you with everything in you, I want you to guard it. Why? Because out of your heart, every issue of life springs forth. And this is the thing about issues in our society. We live in the middle of the most entitled generation in the history of the world. This generation of Americans is the most entitled generation. We will blame everyone else for our issues. We will blame everyone else for our problems. It was my mommy and daddy's fault. It was my ex-boyfriend's fault. It was my ex-wife or my ex-husband's fault. It's my children's fault. It's my job's fault. It's my upbringing's fault. It's the drug's fault. It's the alcohol's fault. We live in a blaming generation and we blame all of our issues on everyone and everything else around us. But Proverbs says issues don't come from outside of you. Issues that you're battling come from the inside of you. 
And if there's issues that you're dealing with right now, if you got issues with somebody, if you got issues with church, if you got issues with the person sitting next to you, if you got issues with your mom and your dad, you can't blame them because the issues of life spring forth from your heart. So if I want to get through the issues in my life, then I have to stop pointing the finger outward and I've got to take an inward look and get honest about my heart. And I'm watching as these things that, that, that affect our ability to get over our issues personally. Now it's spilling over into the cultural issues that we're looking at. So now a black person gets shot by police. Before we have any information, before we know any details, before we know anything about it, all we have is a, is a, is a cell phone video of it, or all we have is, 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 is people, people's reaction to it, and all of a sudden, we split ourselves up and we take sides. It's really quiet in here right now. Immediately, most of us, if not all of us, immediately took a side. You were either on the cop side or you were on the, 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 uh, the victim side. Immediately. And we didn't do it based on any objective fact whatsoever. We, did, we weren't there. We didn't investigate. We weren't there. When it happened, none of us got our CSI badge out, got our shit in there, analyzed the evidence, watched all the different videotapes, heard the eyewitness. None of us saw that. But we immediately acted like we knew exactly what happened. Why do we do that? Because, and why do we not just do that, but we speak with such authority on it? That we will burn down relationships for it about something that we don't even know. It's because what we're doing is we're manifesting the issues on the inside of us. The fact of the matter is, if you are married to a police officer or you have a high view of police or if you have friends who are police, in all probability, immediately when that video came out, you gave the cops the benefit of the doubt. But if you are black, you probably automatically, with the same information, emphatically and decisively fell on the side of the guy who got shot. We live in a society that is so black and white about things that we don't understand. Why does this happen? Why do we do this? Why do we take sides? If you are a Republican, you are probably pro-Donald Trump. Although, if you look at Donald Trump and what he believes, if he were to do something as simple today without changing a single belief, without changing any of his platform, if he were to today say, I am turning in my Republican credentials and I'm going to run as a Democrat, immediately every Republican that right now is defending him with everything they have on Facebook would turn around immediately without any, the man did not change. His qualifications to be president do not change. But immediately we would go from his greatest supporter, if you're a Republican, to his greatest detractor, and if you're a Democrat, vice versa. If you don't like Hillary Clinton, she's a liar and a national security risk. But if you like her, that's not that big a deal. But if she were a Republican, it would flip-flop. Why? Because issues generate from inside of our own prejudice. 
And it is impossible for humanity on its own to see anything from outside of your own perspective. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. See, issues emanate from our hearts, not our mind. That's why the writer of Proverbs says, keep your heart, guard your heart, not your mind, guard your heart with all diligence. Because when the issues come out, the issues never come from a logical place. They come from an experiential place. If you had bad experience with cops, you're, you're anti-cop right now. That's the truth. If you're local and you don't like Howley's, right now, it doesn't matter who comes up to you. You're going to have a bad taste in your mouth for them. You don't even know them. And you're going to call them stinking Howley. Why? Because issues spring forth from experience. And most of us use our experiences, not the truth, to define how we believe, and we argue our side of an issue accordingly. Why did this happen? Where did this come from? Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. In verse 15 through 17, this is where it comes from. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Everything in life when it comes to humanity, sin, and redemption finds its origin in the fall and in creation. And you can find out the reason behind everything. The, the creation and the fall is the root of the tree of humanity. And to find out where we are, why we are, how we are, we have to go back to this to see it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. I want, to, I want you to say every tree. Okay? God wasn't a mean God who had two trees, and he says you can only eat one out of two. God created trees and put it over the entire earth, every different kind of tree. He had every tree he could think of and, 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 and fathom out there and ever want to have. And God says you can eat Every single other tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, if God looks in front of you and says, I'm going to lay out every type of food there is. Every kind of food. Steak, lobster, rice, chocolate cake, apple pie ice cream, everything you can think of. And he says, of every kind of food on the earth, you can eat of any of it, and you won't gain weight. There'll be no calories, no fat. You can eat as much of it as you want. You can have it all. You can eat, uh, I mean, you can, just, you can just take lard and just eat it by the spoonful. You won't gain a single pound. But the only thing you can't eat are carrots. The day that you eat carrots, it'll kill you. Now, how many of you would look and go, that's not fair, God? That's not fair. I really want the carrots. How many of you would be like, that's amazing. Deal. Deal. Chocolate cake. Here I come. Right? That's essentially what God told Adam. But in human nature, it is our tendency to get fixated on the one thing we can have instead of everything that God promised us. You know what is the issue with issues in our life? The issues that you have in your life will keep you from seeing all the blessings of God that he's trying to get into your hands. And you wake up every day fixated on the one or two things that aren't working out for you, and you will, you will ignore every other thing that God has done to bring you to where you are today. And he tells Adam, don't eat of this tree. Now, it's interesting what this tree is. The tree is called the what? The knowledge of good and evil. Now, good and evil are extremes. There's no gray area. You got good and you have evil. How many of you are with me right now? 
Thank you, thank you. <laughs> good and evil. And here comes Adam. And Adam doesn't know anything but God. He was born to have relationship with God. He's made in his image. Everything that he knows comes from only one place, God. His truth is whatever God says, I believe. And the only tree he's not supposed to eat is the only other type of knowledge that exists up to that point. And Adam eats of this tree. And all of a sudden, his knowledge, his, what he understands and what he believes no longer comes from God. It comes from a tree. And this tree is a tree that gives you knowledge of extremes, good and evil. And, and the thing about it is, in Proverbs, it says that you shouldn't just seek knowledge because knowledge by itself makes you prideful. But in your seeking of knowledge, seek understanding and wisdom. Okay? In fact, he says if you're building a house, if wisdom and all these things were, were a house, understanding is the foundation. Wisdom is the house. And, but knowledge is just the nice things that you put in it. But all of a sudden, Adam gets knowledge, and, and a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And all of a sudden, he thinks he knows. And he thinks he's got what it takes to know what's good and what's evil. And he lives his life accordingly. And he loses the ability to understand life and truth in the balance. And so you fast forward now, thousands of years, and here we are. And now we have issues that are gray area issues. And what we see is society in reflection of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We are basing what we think is absolutely good or absolutely evil by what we think we know. And the body of Christ, we're doing it too. When God is looking for people who will be willing to step outside of the issues and into the voice of God. Mark chapter 7, verse 15 says, There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, these are the things that defile a man. See, it's not the drugs that you put in your body that defile you, but it's the reaction that it creates in you that comes out of you that makes it bad for you. If you put the drug in your body and all it did was make you stronger and healthier, the drug wouldn't be bad. But because you put the drug in your body and it causes you to be addicted, it starts making your, you physically sick and it starts causing cravings inside. And all these things start to manifest out of you. That's what makes it bad. It defiles you. It ruins your life. And it's not the things that are coming, it's not the things on the outside, in other words, that are defiling you or that are messing you up and are causing all the issues in your life. It's the stuff that's on the inside of you. And if God can get us to understand that it's the stuff inside of you that's messing you up, not everybody else, not Alton Sterling, not the cops, not anybody, it's what's inside of you that's messing you up. We will go a lot farther and we'll start to get victory over the issues of our lives. We will never see change until people stop taking sides and start taking responsibility. We're so busy taking sides, we're no longer taking responsibility for ourselves. I wish 
that some black folk, can I talk honestly? I wish some black folk would stop pointing their fingers at all the injustice from the cops and start teaching their sons and daughters to stop sta standing on the side of the road, holding up guns, putting it in people's faces. Maybe if we wouldn't find ourselves on the wrong side of the law, we wouldn't put ourselves in positions like that. Now, I know it's not as simple as that. If you remember what I talked about, the black and the white, it's not as simple as that. But what I'm saying is that we need to start taking some responsibility. Maybe if the cops would stop looking at everybody and say, well, but he had a rap sheet so he deserved to die really when was the last time a rap sheet was a reason why you could just pump bullets in a person if we would start looking at that and start if some i wish i know the majority of cops are good cops i wish some good cops would stand up and say we shouldn't just kill folk man it is so quiet in here i'm talking so real right now this is real life right now and I'm not taking a side here. I'm not saying the cops are right. I'm not saying the black folk are right. I'm not saying that all these other people are right. I'm just saying it's not that simple, and we got to start taking responsibility for ourselves. Cops got to start being accountable to cops. Black folk got to start being accountable to black folk. And maybe if we start doing that and start taking responsibility for ourselves, we will start to see some meaningful dialogue happen but right now we're so busy pointing fingers at the other side that the other side has no ability to take anything that we say seriously because we're so defensive right now and it's not getting better it's getting worse because just this morning more cops got shot ambushed and shot in Baton Rouge. And God has to reach inside of our hearts. And turn our hearts towards him. So we can be his voice to this world. God wants to release in you his spirit so that he can begin to flow out of us instead of our issues. Some of you are in relationships right now or some of you in your own marriages in those things. You're, you're in a place of crisis. Why? Because you're finding yourselves without the ability or, or you find yourselves without the ability to be able to honestly dialogue one another without manifesting your issues. So how, how do we start to manifest Christ and not our issues? Well, it goes back to that Proverbs 4 passage. You know how you can start to release the issues in your life? How many of you are ready to be free from issues? You're like, I got issues, and I'm ready to be free from issues. Issues flow out of you as a reaction to what's in you. Every river has a source. And whatever the source is, that's, what the, what, that's what's going to flow out of the river. 
Rivers are made of water. Why? Their source is usually in the mountains where there's rain. Water falls, so the river is water. And you can't change what flows out of you at the place from which at the place where it's flowing, you need to change it at its source. And Proverbs 4 says, that's why you must guard your heart. One of the things about being away for four weeks, the reason why it took so long, was as many of you know, the last year of our lives for our family was very traumatic. Losing my brother to cancer in January and I really haven't had a chance to just process it. And I took some time away to just quietly process. And come to this place where it wasn't so much the hurt, it was the pain. It's painful. And when I came back, I had lunch with my parents. And my mom and I were sitting on the couch and we were just talking. And my mom started talking about John the Baptist. I said, in my head, I was like, John the Baptist, what's the correlation? But she said, you know, John the Baptist was sent before Jesus came. And he came he, because he was sent as a forerunner to prepare the way. And then once Jesus came, his purpose, because he was a forerunner, was accomplished. And God allowed him to go home even though John didn't want to. And she said, you know, when God told us that we could come back to Maui, that it was time to start this, my brother was the first one to move. He moved the, oh, almost two years before we moved down here. And he began to build the relationships and he prepared for it. And here we are now. He poured his blood, sweat, and tears into it. He was drumming at three different places, three different churches, three different days all, all the time. Uh, Saturday nights, Sunday mornings, and Saturday, uh, Sunday nights at different places. And then he'd be going to all their music practices. And he was investing his lives into people. Some of you who are here right now, some of you are ministers here now. And he, he invested into their lives personally with relationship. He never thought about his own time. He just, he just did it. And he set the foundation for what's here today for all of you. And then when it was built, just like John the Baptist he went home. And it hurts me every day that he's not here to see this. That this is just the beginning in 20, 30 years from now, whatever God's house is, whatever it's grown into, that he's not here with us to see this in the natural. But what it gives me is this determination to say that just like he opened up the door for all of us to be here today, now I'm looking for people that are willing to get past the issues. Your issues with church, some of you are here because you got issues with church. And church has hurt you. It has hurt me. But I want to ask you, because I came back from four weeks out in the mainland. I came back, and I am on fire for what God is about to do. The impossible things he wants to do. But he can't do it with the same handful of people who are committed. He's got to do it with people who are willing to, to get all into this 
and say, I'm willing to be a forerunner for everybody who hasn't walked through these doors yet. And I'm willing to put aside all of my issues. I'm willing to put aside all of those things and, and stop flowing out of my issues and start flowing out of the anointing of God. John 7, 38 says, Jesus says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow, not issues, rivers of living water. Now, what's important about living water? When, flow, when living water flows from you, Jesus tell, tells the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he says, if you drink of my water, you'll never thirst again. In other words, you'll never flow out of your issues. You'll flow out of him. But this is what it is right here. Guard your heart with all diligence. Believe in him. It's time that we put all of our eggs in his basket. I put a Facebook Live video yesterday in which I reflected on when I first started working out because I came back from vacation and we were slack. We ate chicken and waffles. We ate all kind of stuff that we don't normally eat. I was slack. I was, it was awesome. I ate Zaxby's every day and Chick-fil-A. It was amazing. And, uh, and I came back, and I had to get back into my normal lifestyle, which is clean eating and, and working out. And, and that first day, it was so hard to get back into it. But as I got back into it, I reflected on when I first started my lifestyle change journey to get healthy. And when I first started... Because I was so used to living a very la lackadaisical life lifestyle, I tried to do it halfway. Well, I'll just eat less rice. And, and I just, I'll just, you know, I'll um, exercise more. When I'm watching TV, I'll go on the treadmill. But you know what happens? I would do it for a couple days, and then I'll be too tired after work one day, or I would have something going on, I'd be too busy, and then I would stop. And because I would, I, I would say, you know what, it's just one day, it won't, be too, it won't be bad. It gave me an excuse, and the next day it was easier to skip. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And before you knew it, I'd fallen right back into my old lifestyle. And it wasn't until I said, you know what, I can't change this way. I need to go all in. So I cut rice out and replaced it with a salad for a year. It was terrible. <laughs> I stopped eating steak and I replaced it with chicken breast. And I woke up at 4.30 every morning to work out. Something happened. I hated every second of it when I started. My life started to change. And all of a sudden... My body started craving the good stuff, the healthy stuff. And when I didn't work out, I felt horrible. And everything in me would be like, I can't wait till tomorrow. And I'd get up and do it. See, you can't diet your way to a life in Christ. Some of you are trying to diet your way to a life in Christ. You come to church when you need it, when you feel like you need some recharging, and then you come for about three weeks, and then after you feel like you're kind of good and on your feet, then you're like, oh, it's a nice day at the beach today. I'll have church on the beach. And the next thing you know, we don't see you for six months until things are really bad, and guess where you end up back again? Why? You're trying to crash diet your way to a healthy life in Christ. You can't do it that way. You have to have systemic change. It's a lifestyle change. You have to get all in. So at God's house, I haven't even gotten a chance to meet with our core pastoral leadership yet. We're going to do that at the beginning of August. But you're going to see some things in which we want to commit to you. And we want you to commit to this thing that God is doing. We want this to be your home. And right now, I know for a lot of you, it's where you attend because we haven't created that space for you. I always said that we would never do memberships here. From the very beginning, I said we won't do memberships. Sounds too much like a country club. And I hate country club church. 
I hate cliquish church. I hate church in which there's an in crowd and there's an out crowd. I don't want it to be that way. But there is something to having the ability to make a commitment to one another and to say, this is where I belong. This is my family. And it's you saying, I'm committing to God's house as a part of this family to take my place, to contribute to what God is doing. But then it's also our and our commitment, like a marriage, saying we're going to cover you in your life. I don't even know what it's called. I don't even know what it looks like. But it'll be space for you where we can really start to get past our issues and start being a family. I don't want everybody to stand up with me. Where have you been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the part of the journey that God knew you were going to be on.